So, hello everyone. I am extremely grateful for you to be here. My name is Livani and uh, thank you for all for coming here and I'm extremely grateful and happy and honored to be among these two incredible people, uh, Becca Vita Vitarelli and Kevin Gottgen, who's uh, as we talk, as we'll speak our relationship will become even more clear, but all Importantly, what I want to say, I have a very particular connection to these two people and especially in relationship to this show. And I am very happy that we have this chance to have this conversation around the, not only exhibition, but the work we're doing individually and also how, how, how our work kind of intersect with each other. So thank you so much. And we're going to follow like not the traditional introduction, but slowly introduction and more details will emerge as the subject will bring that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you too, for being here. Yeah. Um, just an access check. Is everyone good? Is the volume okay? Y'all got what you need? Cool. I like to just ask that question to myself all the time because it's there's so many ways to answer it and difficult sometimes to answer it. But if we have what we need to get started, that's great. Um, so as Lavani said, we're gonna um, we're gonna not start with the usual who we are, and we're gonna let the identity catch us by surprise. I think, and then and then we'll do that. I thought maybe at first we could just. I, I was thinking maybe I could just be kind of like an audience proxy and just like get into the show and like have you tell us about this spell that we're in and and just some of like the 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 details of this. Um, what are we looking at? You know, like, what, how did this come to be? Um, so maybe the first question is, is, is this a spell that has a clear beginning? Is there a moment when you started working on this show? Yeah, how did it come together? I mean, uh, this show in particular, specifically, it really started before I started on this show, per se, and it definitely started on... May 13, 2020, when during one of the first walks, first walks outside during the lockdown, I came across this incredible, dramatic, or at the same time, a beautiful image of sunset reflected in the Empire State Building. And I was like, just like taken away by the fact how much this simple image reflected everything that was happening around, around me and within me. And to me, like one thing I, I kind of like always say among my friends, like 2020, among many, many other things was a year of beautiful sunsets and like incredibly dramatic and beautiful sunsets, which also at the same time reminded me how endings are inevitable but also very beautiful. And they don't necessarily have to be something dramatic or sad, but just accept it as they are and fl fly with it. So like, I think like baseline of this show in particular was among many things, is this acceptance of endings, not as an end or dead in itself, but as a part of the bigger flow and part of this bigger, I would say like flows, yeah, that's called existence. So the the video work was the first one that you mentioned. I wonder if we can just think for a second just about like how many different materials you're using in this spell. And they're so evocative. I mean, there's reflective surfaces um, with, I think, some alchemical processes involved. Um, neon, fine chain, uh, kind of clear and unusual domestic furniture aesthetics of like some there's a lot of kind of domesticity um sculpted um obviously light video um yeah could you talk to us about like how you found these and selected these materials and also the kind of methods yeah. um how did you decide on these actually yesterday when casey was doing the video the video, he just asked me to just name all the materials in the show, so I'll just start from there, just like this list. So digital video with sound, speakers, stainless steel laboratory hardware, 
We have band-aids, wood, uh, plywood, LED lights, plexiglass, latex, mm. recycled wood, found wood, made like carved stone, limestone, and sandstone. Then we have antlers, we have horns, we have other laboratory hardware, glass hardware, we have antique jewelry, antique saddle, and, and, and what's the name? replicas of ancient jewelry then we have liquid mirror glass aluminum stainless steel chain antique steel objects and i think that's it work yeah <laughs> yeah the thing like the thing when like i mean what fascinates me about being an artist or being alive in general is that the, the paying attention to the material richness of our existence. And you know, I always was fascinated by the works that don't necessarily mimic something or makes like a facsimile or like simulacre of something. But I'm more and more increasingly interested using objects and materials that they speak for themselves and they necessarily need to imitate something. So like there's, it's also kind of makes the work so much more complicated because I was just, just because of the reality of like how hard things might be and also how difficult things might be in, in especially living in New York, like all that considering. But yeah, there's this kind of like this sense of internal truth that that work can only exist in limestone, let's say, or like soapstone, that there's no way for me mimicking anything that looks like stone, you know? So like, and that, that's the, the kind of like entire black baseline of my work is how materials, uh, uh, I will remind, Um, obviously, I and we, when we talk about the health and we talk about death and we talk about care, of course, latex come into, comes into play as containing as all of that. It's something that protects, something that actually envelops, something that really feels like skin and something that is actually the natural material. It's derived from the from despite its look to be so synthetic it's derived from the plant so kind of for me it the material itself already it speaks about this country like kind of defies that binary dichotomy that we talked about that that like i'm also very interested in talking when we talk about this natural and unnatural and how much that actually does not work anymore in those binary systems that we are right now so like the material itself already speaks about that and yeah, maybe we should say too the the latex is the the medium that the images are landing on. It's the projection um, medium there. Um, so I, I I mean I just love the way your mind works, and I, I it's you're coordinating so many um, so many ideas. How did you discover that it was a spell that coordinates these things, or yeah, in what ways? is this are these works a spell so i have a very i have two answers to that one is i can one is obviously like i've been uh, thinking a lot not thinking a lot but like i'm interested really the ways the knowledge is produced and disseminated and shared right and thinking of queer knowledge and our ways of kind of like sharing the knowledge. I, I naturally feel so attuned about the history of witchcraft and like those marginalized, there's this ways of, you know, connection and also like same way for me, like same witchcraft or spirituality is another way of to keep in touch or keep the lineage of our ancestors or like people we feel like we continue this like we are in this relationship in continuous relationship but so at the same so I, I was really interested in thinking and I'm always interested to bring in the art context in particular things like elements that are not necessarily 
linked to the art world or like they kind of always left aside let's say when i'm bring like witchcraft or like rave culture or rave strategy so like always interested to kind of cr- bring those things that supposedly don't belong there or were considered something lower outside of it and think because those are the the strategies or those are the worlds that I, I inhabit and those are the things that inspire me or like keep me moving you know and on the so like next so thinking around this show one of the ideas I had I really wanted to die I, I touched a little bit that witchcrafty feeling I get that like for from my few peers for the solo show I did earlier this year at the Artist Alliance in of a Queer Artist but with this show I really wanted deliberately to like tap into it more and what really helped somewhere in the middle of the year I get the email from Ryan he was like we need the title of the show now <laughs> So I was like, okay, that's how it is. That's the spell. So it really helped me. <laughs> yeah. So it really helped me to define. And actually, that was really helpful because if thinking like how I work, first really comes the idea and subject that I really want. I'm interested to explore, develop, and learn more. And my every each show of mine, it's kind of it's almost like. I don't know, like practice of its own almost because I kind of like each show creates the bodies of work that exist within that context with each other and then like next subject it's always like the new subject and I'm just like what's next what do I want to learn next how do I challenge myself next so and and uh, first so so once the idea is kind of clarified approximately then I need to have the title and the title becomes this baseline kind of conceptual grounding then I can build the work like physical work upon so like having the title that early like really kind of helps that they build the work itself yeah. you're doing like a tremendous job of being anti-identitarian in your i thought the question of like who the fuck are we would ha- would demand itself an answer but i guess it did a little bit you're talking a little bit about um spell casting and witchcraft as an ancestral yeah. tradition so maybe now's the time to introduce ourselves. <laughs> I didn't want to just start with it because I feel like this show really problematizes yeah. the demands of identification and I was really taken, I guess it's the the very end of the end of Alice Miller's yes. um, text that's um, reproduced in the, in the video work um, and it describes the kind of the process of becoming an adult um, well adjusted I guess as um, like no longer fearing your biography because you already know all about that. Um, and then I was like, hmm, like, wouldn't that be nice? I fear the biography moment. And I feel like in these scenarios, there's, it's always like a little awkward when you know someone's like reading your bio and then like we're watching your face as you like hear us talk about you. And then it's like, so I just feel like maybe we can think about the problems of identification as we now, as we now do the thing of introducing. Um, so, Lavani, I'll start with your bio. Um, I guess the, the provocation for you is like, how much are you, how, how much fear do you have right now? Um, and then I'll introduce Becca, and then I, we'll see if I feel compelled. I go by the name Who Girl, so the question of who has been, uh, it's like at the heart of my identity. Okay. Lavani, an individual, recently confused for a collective, was delighted by that. A kind of they, but zero pronouns are Z, zero, zeros, with an X. This X could be understood as the unknown variable Levani explores in zero work. This work has explored the aesthetics of places where self-definition and self-knowing are difficult in a good way. The rave, the commons, the home, question mark? Levani is a witch of art science, maybe one word, hyphenated, um, and Z is a coven of which I am honored to be a part. Um, okay, that's what I wrote, and then there's a few other voices for your biography. One, uh, yeah, one that's kind of in the third person, and then, and then one that's in your first person. So, is there anything you'd like me to mention? 
so beautiful. That was so beautiful. Yeah. Really well, I was gonna then I was gonna touched. do like you know the more biographical like which shows you've been in. I could do that. But I think everyone already read it. All right. right. See, there's that other thing. Is that it's like the bio is online. Like yeah. you could go read it. I maybe I do just want to read this part okay. that you wrote. Okay. Um, the fundamentals of my path are empathy, solidarity, and care. As through these mutual reciprocal nurturances, I experience the highest joys of being alive along the journey called together, which I felt like was maybe some of the the best way to also talk about like what is happening in this show. Um, so that's Lavani. Now let's do Becca. How much fear do you have right now, Becca? It's just not going to be as cool as that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until we get to me. I'll make sure it's not as cool. Okay. Um, okay. Becca Vitarelli, born in Mineola, New York in 1992 is an artist, arts professional, and tarot reader based in Troy, New York. She graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago with a BFA in 2015, and currently works closely with the collection at the Tang Museum at Skidmore College in Saratoga, and artist Ryan Turley here at this very gallery. Um, and then there's me. I don't know. What do y'all want to know? It's not kind of not that important. What's that? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you for that very important question about this identity because yeah. these pants are my winter identity. Actually, all you need to know about this is these $14 pants from this um, shop in Chicago where, um, have you ever been to Akira? Oh, yeah. 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 It is not good in terms of the political economy of fast fashion. Not good. Um, I don't, I mean, I didn't really look into it because I'd like not to, I guess, but um, that's where I got them. And they have an online shop and you can order things and things are really cheap and they're so comfortable. And um, actually, I, I think I was wearing them at a music festival where we met in the flesh for the first time because we had only been connected remotely. Yeah. And I think I was wearing these on a particularly cold night that is, it's also represented in the video work. So these pants... Thank you for that wonderful question. That's all we need to know about me. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to make a small introduction, but I would really love either we can read either me or Becca your bio because I think oh. people should know more about you. Sure. Yes. I'm, I live in here in Hudson, so if you want to know more, we can talk in Kiki. No, that was also amazing when, like, so uh, Kevin and I, we met each other virtually first through our mutual friend who's incredible poet and our writer Danilo Machado. They did an article about rave and accessibility especially in the COVID and I mean, there's no post COVID during COVID times. And that's how I learned about Kevin's work. And then we had the conversation and we had the talk and it was incredible to see this person so committed and so kind of like nurtured and formed by rave and, at the, and making it accessible to people who are most today, it most of the times completely overlooked. So like making this access accessibility and accessibility as your primary like goal and work, it, it's, it's, I, ha I have such a huge respect for what you do. And right when we met this summer at the rave at the, in Pennsylvania's forests, that, and that's when I learned that Kevin moved to Hudson. So I was like, okay, this is this is happening. <laughs> like this is we we we're gonna work more together. And with Becca, I'm extremely grateful for being here. I met her at the gallery, and she was incredibly helpful and eager to help with any questions I had, with any suggestions I had. But then also when we learned that we share our love for Taro, I mean, she's an expert. I don't. I just. I just read a, one book about it. And like I have cards and play, play around, which are also like not that like orthodox cards. So yeah, and then yeah, we had like such like deep and interesting conversations and I, it was just like, we were like, let's just do this talk. Like, let's just be here together. So thank you. And I feel like that's where we should go next. Maybe we like, maybe I give this mic to you because I feel like, you know, Becca brings the the witch expertise, the, the expertise now. I was looking for a portmanteau. Um, but I mean, I feel like, yeah, maybe do y'all want to talk about 
the ways that tarot is uh, it interpretive frameworks for this show and also in as methodologies that are kind of different from the other ways of self-defining and identifying that we've talked about? Yeah, I'm super down for that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Lavani and I have, have talked to a certain degree about um, the, the nature of tarot and, and really how um, I think it's a really great medium in and of itself for artists. Um, one of the things that I do at the Tang Collection or Tang Museum when I'm there within the collection is occasionally we have uh, students from classes visit and oftentimes when they come to visit the collection they're doing something that is called VTS. Uh, VTS being visual thinking strategies. And so essentially there are works in the room usually curated by their instructor and or by myself um, and we're using the work present to think more deeply about the conversations in, in, that are occurring in their classes. And that can be everything from economics to art itself to um, math, religion, n a number of things. And I think the cool thing about tarot is that it's a really great framework for doing this exact thing, especially if you're an artist or, or within the arts is tarot sort of obviously is sort of an archetypal uh, system that's already been pre-established, but um, sort of like any system, it's going to change with um, subjective experience, with time, with culture. Um, so sometimes something might come up in the classroom where, you know, we talk about something and it's red and someone will be like, well, red is like, you know, passion and war and love and all that stuff and then sometimes you got to be like yeah and if you go to the east it's good fortune right and so thinking about like what certain things call in and so when we're thinking about tarot it's already sort of doing it's sort of the stained glass window of the contemporary society where like most of us can read now on a, on a larger scale we don't necessarily need the stories projected in that way for us but now we're finding we're, we have these images and we're finding ways to project them into our lives and our society and so that's I think a really great framework for artists and for considering art is um, being mindful of, of that system and, and how are we building and creating our own ar archetypes um, in, the, in the world around us so, I mean, there's a, there's a million things I could say. Do you have any specific questions yeah. beyond that? Or? Yeah, I think, actually, like, I, I, I came across, like, I was introduced to Toro, like, again, like, around 2020, like, late 2020, and then I got my own, like, was gifted the card, the deck, Shining Tribe deck, Shining Woman Drap, yeah, Shining Tribe deck by uh, Rachel Pollack, whose uh, vi the video is dedicated to her memory. And it's also interestingly enough, she lived in upstate. She lived upstate, and she lived here. And she's considered to be one of the biggest, and most esteemed and respected specialists of tarot. She was an artist herself. She was a yeah tarot expert, and only later on also. Um, realized like found out that she's she was a transgender person and that kind of made all the sense after like learning that also the way she approached it. tarot because the card she had that, that became kind of like inspirational like guidance for me for the show is actually not that like typical like traditional tarot decks but she actually really revisits all these archetypes that are generally very much kind of like still very much rooted in the binary systems and the binaries and kind of question them and also visually it's one of the like it's it's a it's it's beautiful artwork and they are these cards because she's very much references different experiences in different cultures from different times and really creates almost like one larger not universal but one large human experience and finds the ways how to make these archetypical images very relatable without really excluding any particular or kind of centering any particular groups and I think that's and that to me explains perfectly what queerness is for me or for us how we actually like and how I I, f I see and find 
in contemporary society, like today, queerness to be one of those frameworks that instead of polarizing everything even more, kind of creates this bigger umbrella where this individual, where the, where entities can exist on their own, but also kind of emphasizes how much interdependent on each other we are. So that was kind of like something that I was really interested in developing further and really kind of like one thing, like what really helped me and why I dedicate this piece to her memory is that really I, 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 I come, came across of, to of her work when I was myself questioning the like next pass what I wanted to do like how do I wanted to rethink my work what because everything was happening in 2020 so everything became for me like under the question there were like times that reminded me that this is a big change and this is big rupture and I don't want to go back deliberately and consciously and I wanted to revisit every aspect of my life and activity to see what it what does it serve what purpose does it have and what is the the changes that I want and have to make you know and one of those things was like kind of understanding that how powerful the the kind of like tapping tapping back into the power of archetypical images how it's almost like this primacy of it you know like it's kind of because like we all carry these like you know, knowledge or experiences for centuries right and so like how we can connect to those archetypes that are like very deeply embedded in our collective consciousness and how can we actually inspire the change in those archetypes because like we can't keep looping on the same way, right? We really need to kind of like make some changes in that to understand that like humans are not the center of the world. Humans are part like basically like like part of this bigger cosmological body and how do we have to understand how can we understand and like instead of again like building the systems of domination yet another systems of domination how can we actually switch to these networks of collectivity interdependence that are also generative and not extractive yeah, yeah. and actually on that too there's a as a great book, um, Cosmos and Psyche by Richard Tarnas, who um, actually, I want to say, was a historian who got really into astrology, so is, is also now an astrologer, and the first chapter is actually all about that. Um, it's all about the sort of subjective universe, whereas currently we're thinking about it a lot as the objective universe, um, but really trying to, you know, what is this fear of anthropomorphizing quote unquote um, the world around us why does that feel less intellectual how ignorant is it for us to consider that we are the center of everything even though when we think back to when there was a time period where we thought the earth was the center of everything and everyone now is like that's ridiculous how could you and yet we're still doing it just on a different scale um, but it's interesting even talking about um you know, you, obviously you sort of mentioned um, queerness and a number of these things again and sort of like these spectral things. And, and again, this is sort of a, a means by which I think about tarot also is like, and, and through the lens of astrology, it may be a little bit easier to digest where it's really easy for people to be like, well... I'm an Aries, so I'm like this. Or you're an Aries, so you're like this. You know what I mean? And it's almost, it can be like accusatory or embodied in a certain way, but like the way that I look at those systems and the way that I look at tarot very similarly is is a matter of polarities. And, and so we've had um, conversations about this where it's really actually very rare like it's that anything is truly black and white. Um, and everything is really much more likely to be somewhere gray on the spectrum. Um, and so it's it's hard to sort of... I would say that the way that I read tarot is, is uh, considered very relational. And so I look at polarities between cards via numerology or other connections that things might have. And I feel like... I think this is a good way to consider and, and think about queerness as well as like there's so many um, spectral ways to consider what is queer, how we identify or don't identify and that like 
there again we're, we're trying to escape those binaries or trying to move or remove from these hard male female straight gay like there's so many things that live between that that often go unacknowledged and i think you know the the longer that i've been interested in tarot and astrology and the occult is that the more that you're looking you're willing to look between those hard spaces or the space between opposites or whatever is the more richer the information you're going to find so like and, and as you talk like about polarities and queerness one thing like we had this like very deep conversation also the day of like installation we started with, with Kevin we had like we were talking about that and one thing that's happening uh, around queerness or used to happen one one aspect is that it's always kind of narrated the history of the queerness narrated as singular individualized stories like bits of stories scattered across the time geographies like an individual stories and one thing it's also it's kind of narrated as idea or futurity that exists as a potential or only as utopia and the thing that i wanted actually to do with this show one aspect is the thinking of queerness not this like bits of history but not what as a formation of one collective body and that's why the entire video is built sort of like experts from the interviews that narrated by individuals but as together it really creates just like one collect it 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 builds on one big like collective body you know and that's also thinking of collectivity and thinking of oneself not just like this individualistic self but more like a um entity that exists within the community it's also like a multi-cell organism that's like very like queer way of understanding oneself in relationship and with relationship of the community and one thing i'm also kind of strongly believe is that like queerness is not something that we we might attain in the future but it's strongly here already and a lot of us are carrying that within and one of the experiences was like exactly the place where like we've met so like i really want to emphasize that this is something that actually alive and here and it's upon us to let it grow and become and yeah and become something that exists strongly and just to because that's the only way how i see that we can build just societies yeah do you hear the the building breathing with you when you started talking about about that it's kind of amazing right it's like a like a nice breath um well do we okay wait how are we doing on time um great oh great oh great okay cool cool, cool. um well do we want to I think Becca and I both have some questions like about the show you know maybe more of the conventional kind of like artist talk closing reception like moment reflection and then we can also take questions from from y'all so um should we should we just like go into question sequence i think that'd be great if you want like i can just sort of ask my question yeah. pass to lavani because i think he, this is really for both of you in its, in its own way um but in it's topical since you brought up the video again um, you know, when you were here at the opening, you sort of gave uh, a little small chat, um, and you were you were talking a lot about visibility and this idea of like wanting to um, make queer people more visible or kind of putting them in a place where they could be more visible where normally they're ignored. And I think it's interesting in the context of the show, given that so much of the obvious overtones or sort of spiritual esoteric occult which are other sort of invisible realm things and so the combination of these right so taking the invisible and making it visible and sort of alchemy in that right and so this idea of visibility and like how you each sort of consider visibility because I feel like obviously that's that seems very important to you but I also know with your background of accessibility I feel like those are really entwined and so I'm really curious to hear thoughts on that thank you Becca. yeah the thing is like for me of course like um where we conditions we were born to and like where we've grown it informs very much 
how do we see ourselves, where do we see ourselves, and how do we relate the world. So like definitely the f there's a lot of factors growing up where I grew up and all of that, how where I always found myself particularly attuned and particularly sensitive to the needs of everyone on the fringes of the mainstream or the power structures. like, And I don't limit that to just queer people. I mean, everyone in any structure, like the f female or female identified, etc. Everyone who feels um, over everyone who's dominated and everyone who feels in, invisible or anyone who does not feel they're, they're even heard or seen. So, uh, and I feel like, and as soon as I, kind of my career took off or I got this like, I'm starting getting like more possibilities or more spaces were given to me, I just feel naturally that I need to address these questions and I want to each, work of mine, each installation is always thought as space for anyone who feels marginalized and visible to feel that it's safe and it's their space and they can occupy as much as they want and they want, they're heard, they're seen and they can grow on that, you know? And then so like, when I started working on this show, there were like incredible amount of bands and particular attacks on trans people and I felt that it was in, like I couldn't think of anything else other than how do I say like th that was the subject of automatically so like most of the voices in the video are by interviews with trans people trans and binary and queer people but still like transness is the center of the video it's also because like I also wanted to kind of like zoom out on this not, not to diminish anyone's struggles but like zoom out also the idea of transness which I'm in incredibly interested interested in because it's also evolves it's kind of like it's it's this idea how something has been overgrown and reaches its new like unfoldings you know and it's like I think and also especially particularly like the transnet itself is I think the most kind of direct I don't want to say attack but like that defines defies all these beliefs that the binary or patriarchal systems are built upon. So I think it's particularly interesting for me also that someone who's more and more distanced themselves from these binary systems and sees themselves kind of like outside of this by gender binary, you know, like thinking like, it's also for me what was interesting to dive into that space even more, explore that space even more. But also one thing what uh, rarely is talked about, it's also like with visibility comes exposure and that exposure also creates, that makes these people or people who are more exposed, exposed to violence too. So that's the like very fine line where we have to, that things has to be done with a lot of care and communication, you know, because like there's this, that's why also deliberately there's no names under, uh, there's no names directly on the video, who's, who's saying what, only at the end, they, they're centered only at the end. At the end. But like I, I also kind of like, this was a deliberate decision of not to have the names right under, like everyone's speaking, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate this question. So yeah, like I, I'm a disability organizer and access witch. Um, actually, it was this time last year. I was like, oh shit, it's December. It was like this same week. I need to use this like flexible spending dollars that I have on my uh, on my eye, like on my optical stuff. You know, like your eye care. And so I went to the doctor and. Um, and he f was, it was like the most interesting clinical experience ever. He was, I don't know, we were just going to talk about like, give me the prescription. I'm going to go like order some frames in your <laughs> lobby. And instead he was like, you're, you're experiencing vision loss. You have irreversible optic nerve damage. And I have been working w in disability world since like 2011. So there's a lot of practices in in the art world that I think are so rad for folks who are non-visual for many different reasons. But I never thought, I was always like, I'm a sighted person. Not anymore. Now I'm losing my vision. Not anymore. I mean, there was like a particular thing we've got that I'm not losing my vision, it seems, anymore. But it turned things a little bit inside out for me because I had always been really interested in description. So like when you're doing, when you're translating visual work into spoken or written um, 
uh, form. Description is the name of it. So on Netflix, you can turn on like audio description. Um, the show All the Light We Cannot See, for example, is like um, is really blind-centered audio description. If you want a taste of it, that I think is the best thing that's like readily available right now. Um, besides, of course, people doing cool stuff in gallery spaces and like stunting with their art. So I've always really like description instead of analysis. That was like a huge awakening for me because just in translating a visual into another modality in order to make it accessible, there's so much interesting stuff there. And I feel like one of the things that I hated about academia was that everyone had to like make an argument. And it's like, what if instead you just described that thing that you found in the archive that was so interesting? And everyone's like, that's not enough. You know what I mean? Like description. So I kind of went on this like you know, like description is the only thing we should be doing. Like, let's just describe the world. Um, and and then there's a lot of problems of legibility, which I think what, is what you're talking about. Like activists who would say like visibility is a trap and um, expanding legibility creates forms of harm. And yeah, so um, I'm not really doing a great job of coherently responding to this. Just to say, I think visibility and also, yeah, like ocular centrism as like a general like organizing principle has been a major like awakening for me. And um, and I think more to come on this because I think we're both gonna like keep uh, talking, maybe collaborating on like access and video work. And I think description um, and non-visual forms of access are like some of the coolest like methodologies in the art world right now. So yeah. that's our teaser yeah, yeah. for something we haven't created yet. Yeah. And actually like also like, uh, like working on this video, like working on this show first piece was I knew I wanted to, it to be a video, but even more so the sound. So basically I built the very first thing that I did, I started building this sound and the sound that I built the video on that sound. So like I really wanted to, like especially the space like really allowed that. I really wanted something, so someone like not even look at anything, but listen to that. And I want that spell kind of like to be in the space and that something that would fill up the space without the need to look anything or know what's there, you know, yeah. Um, well, I have some questions, but does anyone else wanna, I feel like, Anyone want to throw a question in there before I get into some of mine? Yeah. Do you want to? Um, do you want me to bring this over? Do you want me to revoice it? Or does anyone need the mic for that? Okay. Great. Um, so I would just um, first of all thank you so much. Um, we said really exciting works and. Therefore, I'd love to know more about the cultural elements. How do you see that connected to this uh, whole word of cosmologies? It just tell us the word to it. You just want to know more about the cosmology, like the. Oh, this okay. The sculptural works, and are you thinking about the titles? Um, I just I would love to know the story behind the sculpture. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, the um. Uh, the sculptures. So yes, uh, again, like the the show started building around the video and around the sound. But one thing, it's kind of like always interesting for me. It's and what I loved about like learning more about psychology is that there's no way to just get rid of habits. We just need to replace that with something else. So for me, it's the same thing. Comes like for it's not enough. To collective body we're talking about like new embodiments I really it's like naturally the sculptural bodies which is the most um, direct way of experiencing the materiality of the world of ourselves so like the need of sculptures to be there the sculptural bodies to be there that emerge from there and then slowly also like I started thinking of I really wanted to it's like hard to say like I wanted to. I, I felt the need that these sculptural bodies also are almost like these some kind of entities that are information yet. They're not necessarily these like 
de they're not defined or finished or for fully formed in themselves, but I thought of them more as something they photograph that slowly reveals themselves in this process. And it's almost kind of like we have this video in this center, kind of like making a commentary about current political and historical moments. And then there's those like witnesses almost from different dimension and the witnesses from different different timing, you know, like still very much present and witnessing this process, you know. So to me, it is they kind of like open up the another dimensionality instead of like this reality we call reality or political reality. To me, there are more the ones that open up the cosmology and like cosmological dimensions that I'm really interested in my work. And then I also wanted them to stand somewhere between like non, not human, not fully animal, not they, but I still wanted them to have this quality of the deities, so some kind of like more spiritual quality to them. And then also how they, a lot of them carry very recognizable everyday objects and how from there they're emerging into something, something them. And it's almost like the like, kind of like same like talking about this invisibility like metaphor of something like, like these groups of people who generally are completely overlooked or underlooked, overlooked like under other like dominant systems, but actually they take their own, own, um, what's the name, like, yeah, presence and then like kind of like emerge as like new power. So like that's basically like what I was in really interested in doing with these objects. And one thing, I mean, like generally how I work is also, I wouldn't say like my work is kind of like site specific, but it's more importantly, it's context specific. So I'm really very, it's, it's a particularly, I pay particular attention to where the exhibition takes place, its geography, like the, the demographics. So like all, all those aspects pay, like define what the show, how, what the show will look like. So like I got a lot of few objects, like says a saddle or antlers during my various site visits and I purchased them upstate so I was kind of like and there were like other objects too which didn't make it into show but like I, I was really interested also like this like objects that like would speak to me but also kind of like would kind of connect me or my language to the place where the show is presented so yeah that's how certain objects emerged and then like certain elements from these sculptures emerged and then the they were like also like of course like material wise I really wanted like there were like several I, I've been working with this stone for several years early early on when I was still like fantasizing about becoming a monk and like stone doing stone carvings for uh, church churches and then yeah they like gave up on that and then with this show again like thinking of materiality like stones and materials this was something I really strongly felt I wanted them to be in the show. So yeah, that's how they emerged. And they, they also contain some elements from Georgian culture that where I was born and raised. So it's it's also was my way of kind of like going deeper into my cultural roots and think uh, and, and thinking how they can reemerge here in, in today. Yes. And do you um do you see your work um, sort of align with the idea of patriotism or Eastern patriotism here? How do you relate that? I, um, I, I, I try not to think of my work in, let's say, like art, like purely in art context, to be honest. I'm really, as we mentioned, like I'm really more interested in the experience that the experiences that can, can facilitate. So like I really think of them as like agents and I really think of them as something like, again, like this archetypal image. So like I, I hope that they will trigger something in the viewer and that something is something more interested in that like objects in itself. And yeah, I mean, in general, yeah, I love like our history, but also like I, 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 I'm, I really, don't like how it becomes so limiting and so self-referential. So like I kind of like even, even, let's say for me the like inspiration or like inspiration in terms of like how I work creatively, I I mean, I, I look more into even DJs or how different like sound works are built or I look into the strategies of psychology, like how 
like healing from trauma works or I look into let's say like how science set up the test like those are the strategies that I'm more interested in. and that's also like this was for the first time actually with this show where I don't this I, I actually try to not really knowing exactly what I will see there. I'm wondering, so uh, if folks have experienced the, the video work with the sound, um, you'll notice that the, the music that you're working with is um, very evocative and also like very, um, yeah, like stylized. There's like club and rave like you know yeah like kind of dance music but there's also very sentimental music and i fucking love sentimentality and i also feel like sometimes i am embarrassed at how much i love sentimentality because <laughs> like every you know people, it's like not that complicated or something i don't know but here you you are kind of scoring the whole spell you know the space with these um with these songs with these works can you talk a little bit about that and about like i don't know do you think of sentimentality as like a necessary part of the ritual process or a spell casting or like yeah how does um how did these songs work for you and how did you f discover them t in this in this piece but frankly actually like sentimentality or like this emotional discovering emotional connections it's kind of relatively new i think for me too like i mean allowing that to happen in the work is kind of really relatively new but i i kind of i would say like that really again helped thanks to me diving more into psychology and kind of like understanding that the only way to kind of connect into our own truth or bi biography is actually really going there back there emotionally and connecting to that like that like inner child or whatever we kind of want to call that on the, on emotional level like there could be like any understanding like mental or logical connection or understanding of the situations current situations but the emotional connection with that those circumstances are the only one that actually makes them very clear and attainable for us and i think that's that's also became something that i understood how one how humans at least relate to and understand everything more on the emotional level. It's kind of, it's immediacy of the emotion. And I think the muse sound and the words are, or the language are two, these like really magical tools that do that the best. Like there's no explanation needed to the sound, like whatever it invokes, same way as words, right? So like, that's why I was kind of like really emphasizing like, the, the spell, the title itself, and the, like, the time when this show was made was such a perfect timing for this to really focus on these two elements that always fascinated me, but I never had, had a chance to work deliberately with that. So yeah, it's kind of like same way. It's like as words or like these phrases or sentences that invoke very, it's like, it's kind of like, the, 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 I, I think Ryan mentioned or Susan like warm, what, what are the words are like warm? Earworms, Earworms right? Yeah, that, yeah, that's kind of thing. Something that kind of like penetrates one's psyche. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, if, if that's what they do, I'm extremely honored because that's exactly what I really wanted them to do. Kind of like how it penetrates one's psyche and emotional landscape, you know, and like they stayed there. Yeah. I was hoping to ask a question piggybacking off of that. I'm really curious. So obviously you've picked the tower to be your focal point for the show. And I know there's a lot of, obviously a lot of what's going on in, in the work has to do with sort of interpretations of the tower. Rachel Pollack herself sort of talking about the dimensions of, of the tower in a specific way. Um, in my own practice, I think about it a lot as, as chaos, and there's a lot of connotation with chaos as being negative, um, even though really there's, I think, 
sort of negative chaos and positive chaos, depending, again, we're talking about, you know, relationalism, where you fall in a certain spot. Sometimes if you're in a bad spot, getting a bad card is a good thing. Um, but I'm curious, I guess, in relationship to, I know you mentioned, like, wanting to, like, restart, like, restart or, like, endings and all these things, but I'm curious about, like, the nature of sentimentality and inserting those sort of feelings into this sensation of chaos um, and how you, how you want to approach that. Well, same. Another thing, like, chaos was something that, yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, we, we talked, I didn't mention this now, like, like I didn't know that the, 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 yeah, sentimentality and being chaotic are were kind of like two qualities that I try to keep as far as may, maybe not necessarily consciously, but I think it was with this show where I kind of like said like you know what like it's gonna be nonlinear. It's gonna be if it's not linear, it's gonna be nonlinear. Like if we're, whoever and whatever emerges from this show, I wanted to let them be here and then like I, again like chaos and non-linearity, especially for the like specific brain, I'm kind of like very close to being like ADHD condition. So like I think that's one of the way of thinking of many things sim that exist in your brain simultaneously and there's no direct one way of making sense of it other than having a very deep conviction that they actually go together and they are connected, you know? And I think that's like tapping into that conviction the same way, you know, like it's pissed off in the video, she says that accepting the contradiction, you know, like that, that like everything like talking about transness, talking about body, talking about like death or health will be, be like we, we can't talk about this without contradictions because also like we're like kind of revisiting everything like all, all, all the like value systems, right, right now. So like accepting the contradiction that we will feel conflicted about things. I think that's the place where I find myself and that's where I find myself, we're like, we're right here. So like, I, I, I think that like, kind of like accepting that and sitting with that comfortably and accepting that as a strategy or the model to work happens through this show actually, yeah. Paradox is a big part of it, for sure. I just wanted to say I really appreciate the openness of your sculptures, which is very hard to do. Usually, when I come to a sculpture, I have to deal with it. But <laughs> these, I feel like they deal with me. And, and it's very strange, actually. Now, I'll have to think about it more, but and also with the mirror paintings too. Yes. Like these are iconic images, but they work on me differently than art in art history book. Okay. They're like, they draw me in and they become part of me, which is and everything you guys are talking about. It's like liberation. Like this is a, these are crazy times. Yes. And what you're after is like what I'm after. And what, how do you put this stuff into play? into reality, like when there are these forces and these shipping lanes and this destruction, yeah. but I've given, th these are glimmers of hope. And uh, yeah, I was struck by the images uh, of your sculpture online and being with that was just, yeah, it's, it's really, I really like what you're doing. You're like, you're a good cook. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very humble. It's really very, very humble. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Uh, I, I would, I mean, yeah, I would love to hear more about this openness because, like, yeah, it, it's, it's yeah, it beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Please, definitely. Yeah. And also, well, what you said, Becca, about the, um, about why are people so scared of, uh, of being objective? I mean, you know, it's like, like, we all have these experiences that make us who we are, and um, they're valid. Yeah. They're also destruct can be destructive. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the thing is, like, it's. I think we are at, the, at this moment where, like, right now, no one is innocent in in sense of like we. Ca no one is. No one is innocent in sense of like 
I no one can say like I don't know or can abstain. Like we we are in the midst. Like everything happens in is happening in front of our eyes, and we're witnessing it. And it's also like accepting that like carrying the guilt, just the guilt that we inherited from our past is not really helpful actually and it's like the denial and escape from that that actually makes more harm than help and it's a very difficult it's very difficult to face the truth let's say like our biographies in that sense you know like what Alice Miller says but that's the only way to move forward you know and I think like what I really want to do with this show is like this acceptance of endings and make it, but by, by ending, I also mean like ending of being delusional, ending of hoping that like, you know, like kind of like there's a way of we can just hide from our past, you know, like even which is like inevitably just puts us again in this, this dark place, you know, like for me, it's just like where we, we, like understanding and accepting where we're coming from, like this thing of acceptance, it's kind of like very, it's more like, it's something that like any queer person or any marginalized person has to accept that like that's the only way for them to like start life and it's like I think it's it's harder in it's it's harder to for people who kind of like are part of more like dominant or more accepted groups because it's kind of like somehow like shatters the foundations of who they are even more deeply than for, for queerness it's like we know like we have like I don't know like 60 deaths in our life like we have to restart our lives for so many times but like that's the only way to actually um, build the that's the only way to live in a like conscious adult life without really ghosts and li to be liberated from the ghosts of the past. You know, that's, that's I think, where, where we are now. Yeah. And if I can just add on the nature of, like, creation and destruction, especially going back to the, the tower, I mean, that dichotomy is really rich in that card in and of itself, um, in that archetype itself. I mean, it's very... I remember a bunch of years back when, like, Kali from um, Hindu was super um, sort of in the sphere of, of more, like, witch spaces because of this idea of the creator and the destroyer. Um, Persephone kind of holds that space to, um, you know, sort of goddess of the underworld, goddess of spring, and this idea of, like, these, these polarities inherently are, are going to coexist. It's just um, the nature of what it is, and so it, it is challenging to hold on to that guilt because at the end of the day like we individually sort of partake in things and also collectively partake in things and there's only so much we can do as an individual or so much we can do as a collective at any time so again it, it's going back to this paradox is that you know a lot of our existence whether or not we're comfortable with it really is very paradoxical inheritance of collective experiences and how those experiences shape us and the way we relate to each other, you know? And those are like kind of like historical facts and yeah, we just like have to accept and face that and think together how to move through that and how to move forward, yeah. So I, I wonder how we end because your interest in endings is like so um, explicit in, you know, in the video work especially, and spells. I mean, it's kind of an interesting. We, I, the first question I asked was like, how did the spell begin? And like now it's like, how does a spell end? Or, um, you know, this is like the closing of this show. Is it also the closing of this spell? Like, uh, yeah, like how how do we end, or how do spells end? Another way to ask that I think is like, how do we know when a spell is working, or when it's not working, or it needs to not work, or something? Um, thinking about the effects or ripples out from a spell. So, how do we end? Uh, yeah. Well, um, the spells, the way it worked for me always, and actually how I built this was that. Uh, that's actually like also how I function and how my life works is that over the period some time like I always hear there's it's gonna be a word or a sentence 
that I, it could be from the lyrics from the song or interview or repetitions to certain spells. I, I actually like built entire word like work as a spell, as a continuum spell and particularly also sentences. So what I was thinking for the closing of this show is the premise is actually also kind of like the endings and acceptance of endings, but more but more so in order to open up for these like uncharted and new spaces that we are yet to discover. So I was thinking to end this conversation and the show today as collective spell together and I invite you all I invite us all to just repeat together short spells and that's how feel free to say it out loud feel free to don't say it at all feel free to say it for yourself internally but if you want to close eyes however you feel more comfortable it just it just for me it's just like I what I strongly believe in is that intentionality and decision so like it's I know it's a process like the change or like whatever any changes however radical or small we want to make I, I believe it starts with the decision that we want that change and then once that kind of like message is sent to our psyche then I believe that the work is already has already the work starting there and that slowly when there's an intentionality it just finds its ways how and how it will how that process will go so say, say, same with his days like it's just like putting the intentionality and decision and then let the magic unfold itself you know so it's it's just like three sentences from the video which uh, modified a little bit and uh, should we is it okay so <clears throat> Yes. So uh, the first would be like the systems that we've locked. The systems that I locked myself into are not actually confining me. The ideas I've locked myself into are not actually confining me. The beliefs I blocked myself into are not actually confining me. I am free. Thank you so much. Thank you all.